Welcome to The Geometric View, Episode 28, Season 3. I put together a presentation on helicon physics and triple piece ghoul modalities. And the Doherty set. Life is plasma. Liquid crystal. Get ready to get bare naked as fuck. Swooned in a whirlwind of life as all things are blossoming. Living transformational art piece. You are a blossoming genius. I'm your host, Buddy James. Strap in. Here we go. Reaching out. Please support um, us on our Patreon link below. Looks like we have Thank Chad you. Kushner. And uh, the call's still going out. Good morning, good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, 6 2020. And this is the Geometric View, episode 28, season three. Um, we got Michael McDuffie joined, uh, Colin, some howdy, other. Howdy. Hello, how you doing, Michael? Good, sir. Good. Good. Thank you for checking up on me uh, midweek, man. That means that means a lot. I went through uh, I went through the ringer this week. Went through a lot, that's for sure. Damn. Well, my heart goes out, man. Appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> well, it looks like we have a small gathering. We got four. Of us. <laughs> got four of us here. Um, we have Cosmic Sojourner, Maximilian. Michael, thank you guys for being here. Welcome. How are you doing this morning? Fine. Everything fine. Just connecting. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. I don't mean to put anybody on the on the spot here. We're just getting started. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, I have I've designed a presentation for today. I'm going to be doing this, I think, for every episode here out because I I have so much material to present, I might as well be making um, a slideshow presentations on the regular every week. So if I do 50 of those a year, you know, that's like 50 presentations I have. So, but I, I want to be concise, you know, I don't want, I don't want it to be, and this is, this is the part of the show that's, that is um, making me work harder and harder to be a better presenter, to make the material more precise and more concise and um, just shorter, condensed, you know, condensed uh, versions. This show I love because we all spend um, a good time with each other and we all get to know each other more and more. But I'm hoping to condense my presentations to the beginning and then we can spend a lot more time together because um, I just don't want to feel like I'm the only one talking. We all have so much to talk about, but I do have a lot to present. So like once I'm done presenting or, you know, even during, I want to make it so that we can uh, seamlessly do and talk about whatever we want to get into, which one of the things is uh, bubble sculpting. Um, I'm getting. Bubble uh, sculpting. Yeah, I'm moving hardcore on bubble sculpting. So today's show, uh, welcome everybody. It is episode 28 of the Geometric View, season three. And today we are doing helicon physics um, the, uh, and math, the math of what helicon waves are and uh, how we interact with helicon waves, uh, what, what they are exactly, and the geometries of them. And indeed, they are definitely inside of uh, the Doherty set. So I'm going to show a few pictures here at the beginning because they're at the end of the slideshow. So I don't have to keep hopping around on my slideshow. I'm going to get everybody up to speed on kind of the direction of where I'm going with this. Because I've been pulling shapes right directly out of the Doherty set, the Doherty network. Um, Two-dimensional shapes, I slice them out. And then I put them together and I make three-dimensional um, solid objects with them. So I'm going to pull them up here. This is a picture of one. You can see my nipples. That's funny. Um, you, can, you can see that it is uh, this, this tetrahedron shape. Okay. This is the tetrahedral shape 
But what's really strange is this is the shape that energy decides to cavitate into when it's moving through a cylinder. When charge is moving through a cylinder or even sound and um, energy, it, it condense, condenses to this shape. And that's what's in the presentation. So I built them. I didn't know what it was when I was building it. But now I only built this like six months ago, if that. And now I know what it is, why it is the shape that it is, and why there's nested recursions of them inside of each, each other. Um, these shapes, particularly, um, on many different multiple levels. So that's the solid shape. Uh, we'll we'll get into that moving in 3D spin, adding spin to it, uh, creating uh, Whistler waves and. Whistler waves is the first type of helicon wave that uh, we discovered in the 80s, um, I believe, 86. But yeah, so this is a pretty new science, um, and I'm breaking it apart because I started designing these, and I didn't know what these were that I was making. I could tell that it was charge and charge and filamental, filamental layers with and nested subharmonics, and it's all based on toroids. So the toroidal body or field gives way to the helical filaments inside of the field. And you can see how I break it down here. This is the largest, widest um, filament that comes off the, the center, which would be the first filament. And it's actually goes right on top of this one because these one and two are the same. They're part and parcel of each other. But after that, um, so this is one off the center. Here's the center, the center being the center here. So one off of this sphere. And you get this helicoid, helicoidal um, filament. So you go two off, and you get a tighter nested filament two off from the center, two over R squared, or one over R squared is the whole thing. <clears throat> um, and this is what Bessel functions and the filaments are. So this is the actual breaking down the geometry of it inside of a field aligned current. This is a Bessel function, um, Birkeland current. Um, so the Bessel function naturally tends to want to, there's, uh, azelmuthal flow, which is a wraparound current around the center. And as these currents wrap around, they wrap around again and wrap around again and wrap around again. So here's one, two, three, the third off, and it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. The filament gets thinner. Here's one, two, three, four, five off the center. It gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and they keep nesting in quaternion filaments inside of each other. This is what everything is composed of. This is the um, how hierarchical space-time dynamics or plasma breaks down from electrom from magnetohydrodynamics from the sun and breaks off into individual filaments, which ultimately turn into creatures, and they they are recurrent creatures. They produce these. They, they condense out in the Van Allen belts, these waves, they're a ultra low frequency wave. And how you get phase conjugation is adding um, a high frequency to a low frequency. So what's happening on, in the Van Allen belts with these Whistler waves is they're, uh, they're subsonic, hypersonic uh, sounds and chirping. If you go in a forest, in the boreal forest or up even further, uh, you you can stand in a pine tree forest and hear the aurora borealis. So this is the geometry of listening to the, um, listening to Birkeland currents. This is the geometry of what a Birkeland current sounds like, what it also looks like. So if you, if you are uh, able to melt one sense into another and 
be a synesthete or a synesthesia, if you have some of that, you can hear the auroras and see these shapes. Same with beating on a drum. When you're beating on a drum and people start singing, you can start feeling these elastic, fibrous, fibril-like layers. This, um, there's only two chiralities here. There's a chirality of, of, of in, in and out, um, a right-handedness and a left-handedness. And you can see that they are all stitched. And this is just one of the filaments. See all the information happening in the background that's not, if I were to put all the filaments on top of each other, this is just one filament. Look, it turns into a flower. That's why we have phylotactic arrangement, phylotaxis and, and flowers and minimal surface energies or minimal surface packing. Um, so when you take these Whistler waves, which now that I now that I've put these images in your head um, and we can start to think of these, how would they start moving? What would they look like um, as a longer filament? If you could take it and move it to the side view and take the side view and move it to the uh, anterior posterior view, you know. But now let me let me get into my presentation. How's everybody doing? Doing good? Thumbs up. Already intrigued. All right. I'm enjoying it. Okay, so I've just recently, so I'm like stumbling on uh, ecstasy, fumbling towards this, this as a teacher and a learner at the same time. And I want people to, um, Chad actually put together a really good video of, uh, of these. I don't even know if he knew what it was when he was making it but it is helicon physics it is helicon waves that you and whistlers that you were working with chad inside of that um what's the whale the uh oh yeah the space whale animation the yeah. the four centrifugal waves yeah um i didn't realize that was helicon physics but i have been playing around with uh certain helicon mathematics lately so nice. um not not anywhere remotely close to your work but still fantastic yeah, I, I mean, I, I found it in my, I found it in the grid. I just highlighted it. I started coloring it. Literally, I was like, I was like, oh, look what happens when you highlight this filament and you nest it and subnest it inside of this filament. And it all bows down to the center of the throne. And all creatures, when they put their heads towards the center of the throne, Throne. They all bow down to the creator and say, uh, thank you, thank you. And they're appreciative. What's weird is sprites do the same thing. Sprites, upper aurora. I was going to do this episode on sprites this, this weekend because I've been studying that like a hound, the higher um, energies and, and elves, sprites, higher um, atmospheric electricity and uh, currents that are happening. It's really intriguing me and I'm, I've been uh, studying it. And I've also been studying patterns of, uh, of, of dust and what happens with this huge dust plume that's coming towards the United States. It happens every year, but this year it's big. So in Michigan, we're gonna get really beautiful sunsets this weekend. Um, and all the asthmatic people who have problems with breathing are going to get all asthmatic we're going to get asthmatic brah so this i'm okay so i digress but i also was progressing forward see what i all i all i found was that this when you wrap it around and you connect this torus to this torus it's the exact same torus because it's the same number coming off but it's down one layer. So you're moving up a dimension. You could consider it a dimension or just a vector, but you you connect it and, and it all goes in and this is what the ether is composed of. This is what space-time DNA, plasma DNA, um, conscious 
thoughts, consciousness, how you can move things with your mind. Um, just like there's, there is a Jed to it, a Jedi. We got into the Jed earlier in one of our last couple episodes, but we didn't cover it as deep. The Jed is the center of the throat of the Taurus, of the black hole, of whatever center you are around. And we are all centers of the whole universe. There's a, a, a quote that I'm going to botch here, um, but it's, it's like, we are the circumference of a circle. Uh, I, I'm already, I'm already not going to say it cause I'm going to botch it, but it might come to me in a minute here. You are the circum, we are the, we are a circle. The circumference is everywhere and the centers everywhere. That's the quote. Something along those lines. It's a good one from that movie. I'm, oh, I'm the worst at remembering names and movies and stuff. I Heart Huckabees. The best, dude. Oh, such a good movie. Okay, on that note, I'm moving into the presentation, guys. All right. Wait till this thing goes down. Hide this. This moved last time. This is in my way. Maybe if I don't, there we go. Okay, well, uh, helicon physics. Geometry of Whistler Waves and Triple Piece Gold Modes by Buddy James. This is a drawing that I created, as you can see. There's that shape that I showed earlier, the three-dimensional shape. You cut that out and you put four of them together and you get the tetrahedron. And the tetrahedron that moves through space using these spiral dynamics as charge compresses into these platelet-like um, forms in three dimensions we'll get into some images here it's really intense so scientists have presented research a curious on a curious cosmic phenomenon known as whistlers very low frequency packets of radio waves that race along magnetic field lines the study proves the study provides new insights into the nature of whistlers and space plasmas and could one day aid in the development of practical plasma technologies with magnetic fields including spacecraft thrusters that use charged particles as fuel. So Whistler waves exist as a space plasma out here. And, uh, um, and they are, I'm, I'm gonna get more into what they are, but I'm gonna just kind of talk about what they do here. Uh, we detected them first in like the 1800s um, with when, carriers were from one line to another telephone line to another were hearing all these weird <whistles> all these weird static like springy sounding things and it was these whistler waves that they're hearing that are moving through the earth through the poles from the top and in multiple layers in these van allen belts now i surmise that and I've been doing, according to the geometry that I work with, and sonobiology, um, and the Doherty set, Love is Watching, looking at this simple, simplex super geometry of the Doherty set, you, you can predict, you can use it as predictive power and, and, and show with exactitude, how these um, how these helicon waves nest and nestle into larger and subnested layers of of their heli their helical structure. I'm going to be doing a helicon um, conference. It's going to be called Helicon here in Detroit. Uh, it's it's going to be involving all things helicon and call including. I might I might do a separate festival for the uh, lumberjack uh, fractal branding 
Lichtenberg fast, something like that too. But these are the directions I'm headed. And this is the kind of stuff like bring people together about science, make it cool again, make people curious about what are these angels out here? What are we hearing? Is it, why does the earth make so much noises? Does it need to re recombine itself sometimes? And this is why people go nuts and people go crazy because of all these, all this solar electric activity. We did an episode where this girl in Alaska went crazy. This is how I found out about uh, cyclotron resonance and cyclotron radiation where the government is using these waves to their advantage and there's ultra low frequencies that they're using. But what I'm more curious to talk about with these is our relation to them, how we eat them, how we ingest them. Can we build plasma bodies around our bodies that are like these and similar? Because I just had this inkling, this, this, uh, intuition that everything was whistling and it's all going you can hear it in the past three or four years that i've been talking on these podcasts i've been doing i say this and then all of a sudden i find out whistler waves then i find out the geometry that i'm working with is all whistler waves it's all nested thick juicy layers of of ether that is these helicon waves that are broken down Birkeland currents into into individual um, quanta, individual quanta. These Birkeland currents break down into packets. And let me go to the next one here. So I did this when fidget spinners were popular. I found this shape a couple years ago. And I'm like, man, that's really cool. And you see how aerodynamic it is and how well it spins on your fingers. And then I'm like, man, all right. Whistler waves are considered a form of helicon waves or low frequency electromagnetic waves that travel in a corkscrew-like or helix-like pattern. When helicons interact with plasmas, they exert a pressure, with pressure and torque on the electrons. Now, envision the pictures that I showed before I started the presentation the black and white images of these electromagnetic waves that travel in corkscrew-like helical patterns. These are helicons. They interact with plasmas. Now, the researchers believe that better understanding these properties could someday lead to the design of plasma thrusters for space vehicles. We'll show some designs here later in the presentation of those. These thrusters use electricity to propel plasma to extremely high speeds faster than a chemical rocket. This is the best kind of propulsion we have right now for plasma thrusters. So um, here's citing my sources down there. Helicon, the name Helicon was suggested in 1961 by Agrain. Study that guy. Boom, all these guys are plasma physicists, dude. All of my, first I'm in love with mathematicians. I love mathematicians. Then, when I, when, I, when I found out that the electricians were speaking my language and they knew what I was doing, and then I started to find out that what I was doing is what the language they were talking about, it's all plasma and electricity. The power companies hijacked the show, and we need to get back into the filaments. And, I mean, it's, we, are always, we are already working with plasmas on many different um, modalities, including our cell phones right now bunch of plasma and different things there okay so this guy look him up great awesome fun stuff so agrain for whistler modes in solid state plasmas shortly thereafter it was used for whistler modes in gaseous plasma columns whistler wave theory earlier formulated for plane waves in space plasmas Plane waves and space plasmas. If you go back shortly thereafter, if you go it was back in Whistler modes and gaseous plasmas. Plane waves and space Whistler plasmas. Wave theory earlier take that iterated iterated it down. Plane waves and space Whistler plasmas wave. in 1953 so. by this dude. See all these guys. I like Boswell. All these guys. Wonderful studying these these 
these individuals because their minds are like moving towards the direction of what I'm doing. And it's like, yeah, let's get into it. Okay. This was adapted for wave propagation in cylindrical geometry. Oh, man, that just makes me come. Sorry. I'm a horrible person for saying that. Not really. It is what it is. Seriously, it's all electricum. The whole universe is having sex. And we need to start recognizing this beautiful principality of the universe. So this cylindrical geometry, which is still the same today in 2015, Helicon waves were found to be useful for producing dense plasmas for applications like plasma processing and propulsion. Boswell. Okay, now, I drew the geometry. I'm super excited for coming up with it. I'm way more excited that it was already discovered because now it's, the, it's proof of the concept. See? So I do this stuff, then I look, and I find it. And I'm like, Yes! When I find it, because it just validates it, proof of concept, time and time again. The Doherty set is making history. This is part of our future. This is like fractal geometry and how much that changed our minds. When you start understanding things from a fractal mind and a fractal perspective, you start understanding how the universe works because it's the mathematics of nature. Fractals are the mathematics of nature. The Doherty set is the mathematics of plasma, dark mode plasma, invisibility, things that are invisible, energy coming from your heart, radiating and changing and making a difference in the world. So I'll continue. A large community developed which understood helicons as Whistler modes and radially bounded plasma columns propagating axially along the ambient field bow, the field bow. Mm. The dispersion relation in cylindrical coordinates implies that the waves have axial, radial, and azomuthal wave numbers, the latter being quantized by integers m radial boundary conditions are assumed to produce radial standing waves described by Bessel functions. Radial density gradients also affect the mode structure and suggest the existence of other modes. Trivial piece gold. Trivial piece gold. We did a whole show on Triple Piece Gold a couple episodes ago. Um, that's the space that is, that's the counter space that's spinning along with the Whistler wave in the column of the cil cylinder. The counter space is the Triple Piece Gold. So the actual helicon physics is complicated by under, by unexplained wave dampening, different different mode excitations, ionization, nonlinearities, neutral gas depletion, double layer formation, diagnostic difficulties, etc., as summarized in a recent review by Shen in 2015. There it is. Now tell me that doesn't look exactly like the black and white images that I that I was just uh, showing those those individual helical trails moving through uh, plasma, moving through space. This is all space weather. Space, space weather is the future. It is. It literally is the future. It tells you what's going to come onto Earth in the next couple days. You study space weather and you know the future. You start prognosticating it. And it's very easy to predict a lot of the space weather because um, when, when something happens on the sun, something happens on the earth, as above, so below. I'm not going to read this for it's, – it's just a bunch of stuff, isosurfaces, cylindrical surfaces. Okay, maybe I will read it. Um, topology of a helicon mode. I'm going to skip over some stuff. Contour plot of the field component. 3D field lines passing through the peaks of the BZ, the field lines of the six nested left-handed helical screws of alternating directions on the cylindrical surface along BO. Okay, so the BO, okay, that's the BO direction. All right, so added to our isosurfaces by BZ. Okay, BZ, isosurfaces. Oh, this is so fucking sexy. 
and we're going to look at a bubble here. Someone designed a, a, a cool bubble, a helical bubble. I think we might have covered it, but we're going to look at it again. There are three azomuthal wavelengths per circumference in phi, and each helix has an axial pitch of these wavelengths describing the phase relation. It's all phase conjugate. These can't exist without phi. They're dependent on phi dampening and phi, literally. Same with all of the geometry that I do. Look, there it is. See, that's the head of it. That's the head of it. It comes together. Here's the helicon wave as it completes in the red. And when you look at that shape that I drew and the shape that I, I'll, for those who haven't seen at the beginning, uh, go to the beginning of the show or the end because the end of the slide here you'll see you'll see images uh, in sculptures that I made of these I want to name this something this shape it's a helicon that's what it is it's a helicon okay so the counter space around it here as it moves is the triple piece gold triple piece gold okay so we're going to see that in motion here in a second. Boom. See that as it jitters out and moves? Yes. So good. And it, and it, it just backs up uh, all the stuff that we've been getting into and I've been disclosing on this, on this show. I think I found what I want to go to school for, guys. I'm extremely passionate about this. And um, there's... This is our future. This is how we're going to get to Mars. This is where Elon Musk is. It's all electric. Our future is electric. There, Elon Musk came out with Tesla and, and said this is an electric revolution. This is what we're in. So in an electric revolution, we are leading the fringe of the tips of these. Sure, we might not get the credit, but it doesn't matter. We're leading the fringes of the tips. That's sparking the flame of the fire. That's feeding the fuel for the fire. MC Escher did drawings, didn't care about the math of them. Everybody did the math of them after, and it's infinite, and it's beautiful, and all this other crazy things. He didn't care about it. I didn't care about the math. I don't care about the math. Now I do a little bit more, but it's like, I have so much to reveal. So This is just one tiny little piece of the Doherty set, and it happens to coincide so much with space energy plasma your dna how we're connected to all these multiple cords that are uh, go through our umbilical cord that go all the way straight into the sun before any of us were born it's it's these it's it's showing stan tenon in the body electric the electric body the electric biosphere everything is electric and even these even these helicon waves are electric and they sing, they sing to the earth. Talk about a meditation, put on some real gut earning, yearning, churning sounds of the earth and listen to helicon waves. And, and um, uh, there's a million different words for these whistler waves. Uh, there's hissler waves, whistler waves, there's cathedrals, there's, uh, there's just one after another and they sound like heavenly sounds. Now what happens when the ionosphere comes closer to the earth, everybody can hear it. And the rocks start crying aloud. And the plants start, you can hear, if you put electrical sensors on plants, you can hear them right now. There's technology that does that. When the ionosphere comes closer to the earth, everything squeals and starts sizzling like a pancake. Well, not sizzling or squealing, I guess one way to put it, but it, it's compression and rarefaction. So during certain events, the earth does this. And, and during the past, um, during the past, we, we theorize groups that I work with, um, the electric view and things like that. And um, uh, di different people that I've been working with uh, that, that this is a normal this is a normal process on the earth and i went through some stuff this last weekend i'd love to get into detail about it um but i had a full visceral apocalyptic vision as if we were to go through an x-class solar flare 
and everybody was melting around me and I was seeing dead people and like I saw the entire thing turned around came back out the house and it was all happening again and, and it was just like it's really strange to see bodies deteriorate and mind fields continue to move but yeah, I I think I took the heroic Terrence McKenna dose that's talked about, and I went all the way to through the veal, uh, through the looking glass, and I saw things, um, future technologies that I don't know if they're future or if they're c current and existent right now. But yeah, I was very perceptive and vigilant, and I, I knew some shit was going down, and I had a fun, crazy, intense, and very, very informative um experience this weekend so the heroic dose i wouldn't suggest it for everybody but yeah if you want to look into that that's terence mckenna talk about that stuff oh we talk about it a lot on our show so i just might as well say it entheogens ingesting god and theo taking god within so these are waves with helical phase helical phase fronts produced by axial and azomuthal phase propagation the latter forms azomuthal engine modes, IGN modes of mode number M, blah, 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 enhancing information flow, blah, blah, blah. So I took this verbatim. I literally took these words out of this paper with all of these images. So I will credit that and, and that will be in the link below. Um, so they're basically talking about this. Sometimes science and math gets dry. So like, I'll put a little flavor and spice on it and just skip past that shit. Uh, but some people like the math. So I'll read a little bit about this. Um, three consecutive snapshots, B, BZ, XYZ, demonstrating the phase rotation in phi direction. Oh, phi direction. <laughs> Everywhere you go, phi. Some say phi, some say phi. Helicon mode. The phase fronts have the shape of an Archimedean spiral due to the radial outward propagation at a constant speed. Um, I think that's, I don't know what that is, but this, okay. The, in 3D, the phase surfaces form a right-handed, excuse me, right-handed Archimedean screw. White circle indicates location of the antenna array. Okay, all right. So you can see the shape that I showed earlier. Um, whoop, skipping the wrong way. You can see the shape that I showed earlier here. And this is all the way down. You can see that's the same thing. I just colored it and moved it down layer by starts here, next layer here, next layer here, next layer here, next layer here and it moves inwards, spinning like plates, but it's a 3D geometry that produces these, these um, whistlers and these tubes. Okay, so in parallel, the research on electromagnetic waves with angular momentum developed rapidly. These are waves with helical phase fronts produced with, oh, I just read that one. Okay, so let's just kind of look at this here. All field lines converge into the right and characteristics of helices to the left. The field lines cross. They return through the plane and join the spirals with opposite field line directions. Thus, cross field closure is possible due to angular clefts. Ugh. Love reading near the axis of the transverse fields have the circular polarization of parallel whistlers. Parallel whistlers. Now, I'm going to fast forward this speech or talk or whatever because I did put some images in here. Now, look at these. This is what we're talking about. This is it. But they're only seeing one. I know that there's an infinite amount. They probably know there's an infinite amount too, but... And the in the images they're designing, they're only showing um, uh, one pair of perpendicular Whistler waves. See now, when you get the other chirality of the Whistler waves involved, you get you start to get the pine coning shape like these, 
where these are all one way, but if you flip it, they're all going the other way. I didn't put the other image on here, the one I showed earlier. So I'm going to wrap this up here because I think we're kind of getting the idea. Um, so you take these shapes. Helicon modes and plasmas can also have helical phase fronts, hence angular momentum. The fact that they are bounded column modes is not the cause for their azelmuthal prop propagation. It is the wave excitation with special antennas which rotates the wave phases. Ooh. In helicon devices, the end. I haven't read this, by the way, yet. I, I copied and pasted it. So that's why I say when I mean I'm learning while I teach, that's what this is. I haven't rehearsed it either. So in helicon devices, the antennas are usually external to the plasma and non-rotating. In order to study the waves without the complications of helicon sources, we have used a large afterglow plasma of uniform density and magnetic fields, absence of boundaries, internal antenna for excitation of linear waves, which are measured and re resolved in 3D space and time. Under these conditions, we can employ linear superposition principles for measured waves and construct the radiation patterns of antenna array used to excite high order helicons of both positive and negative modes. First measurements of the phase fronts and wave magnetic field lines have been done. These observations show that helicons defined as Whistler modes with helical phase fronts ex ex exit in unbounded plasmas, just like helical electromagnetic waves in free space. Ooh. Yeah! It also implies that plasma helicons can exist in space plasmas. Also, Whistler waves, and if you guys didn't know the atmosphere is a plasma, if anyone didn't know that yet, it's a plasma, and you can sing to these Whistler waves, and you can communicate with these Whistler waves, and uh, if you have a certain voice, you can sing the Whistler waves. Um, I'm I'm going to particularly, I met this female this last weekend, and she sings the Aurora. She's from Alaska. Her voice sounds like the Aurora, the sheets of the Aurora coming down. So I want to take her in and figure out scientifically if there's some way where we can figure out indeed that she is singing the Aurora. Because the it just oh my gosh it's the heaven it's like brings you heavenward when you hear her voice. So, <clears throat> although Whistler waves were discovered in space plasmas, there seems to be no awareness of Whistler modes with angular momentum in space plasma. A few publications mentioned helicons in space plasmas, but refer to Whistler flux ropes rather than waves with angular momentum. Thus, the field of helicons is wide open in several areas of, pl of plasma physics. Now, what I'll say about that is, the, as far as these flux ropes, that's what I'm, that's what I'm drawing. They're flux ropes, but it's they're pla they're Birkeland currents. But I mean, what? Are, how many times are you going to call it Birkeland currents? They're like condensed Birkeland currents, like maybe Birkeland, like mini Birkeland and it's either way the geometry is the same it's the same on a micro scale it's the same on a macro scale it's the same in a fluid scale it's it's super fluid the sun is sonoluminescence and it's super fluid and we are part of this super fluid membrane inside of a womb and we are in a nice warm womb and there's plasma spirits all around us, and that's these helicon waves. And and if you're an, an empath like me, you can tune in and tune out. Um, and sometimes you, the veil is real thin, and you don't want to brush with brush uh, shoulders with some of these spirits or entities because they're thick. And these thick spirits and entities go up into the upper atmosphere and release themselves as cold plasmas. And, and the higher, uh, uh, and as elves and sprites and all this beautiful stuff that we're going to do an episode on next week. Next week, we're going to do the geometry of these, uh, um, what's the word? I think I wrote the exact word down. 
Yes, transient luminal events where uh, elves happen in the thermosphere, uh, sprites happen in the mesosphere, blue jets happen in the troposphere, and there's uh, it's pretty much all rope magic. When you study rubber bands and ropes, it's all beautiful. So wave energy is focused radially inward and outward. This is, this looks almost like, ooh, hex, hexadecapole. Yeah, that's my new word of the day, boys and girls. Hexadecapole. That's sexy. Hexadecapole. Hang on, let me pull. Hexadecapole. Let me pull. <laughs> let me pull my hexadecapole out real quick. <laughs> what was that, Michael? My, my hexadecapole is bigger than your hexadecapole. Dude, let's measure. Let's let's measure. There's only one way to get to the bottom of this. Let me see yours. Oh, I love. Shit. I do love a new word. I do. <laughs> Oh man, I'm feeling great this morning. How are you guys feeling? Good. I'm glad everyone's silent. I got your attention at least. There's a pin drop. I can hear it. The party is lit, bro. The party. <laughs> Party's lit. You can tell by the lull. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Everybody's sleeping, drooling on their desk. <laughs> I'm about three right. sips into my coffee, so I'm 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 about as good as I'm getting for a minute. I'm hey, here. Bro, I'm just I, working on a project. I gotta say, I see. I feel like I say this kind of stuff a lot. I, we fall into patterns, obviously, but you know, you're. You, I, I so appreciate your thinking process, your capacity to unload, like. And this is the wonder that I discovered, and these are the connections I made. And then, without any real sort of effort, these connections got made, and this is how I got to this. This is a very authentic way for discovery to occur, and for awakenings to occur, and for you know um, movements to occur. Is that sort of spark of that childlike uh, excitement that you get, and that you're able to articulate that thinking process that leads you to places, and and the confirmation process that allows you to know that you're on the right track and that it starts with you in the same way it starts with me, buddy, in that the sort of abstract idea that you sort of find things to support this thing that's floating around in your head. It's like you build the planet first and then you build the leg. The idea happens first in a bubble, mm -hmm. uh, bubble, right? And then you connect it to other things which make it ha have context. The idea of a Birkeland current, for example, as a thing that exists is fascinating to me and i all now all my science nerd friends are talking about the reality of birkeland currents and that those are realities right mm -hmm. and so we're coping with that reality and then you come along and say oh this is the life cycle of a birkeland current this is how it exists in this phase these are this is how these birkeland currents interact with each other and this is how these birkeland currents exist at the end of their life phase this is how they decompose and this is how they break into smaller parts so it's that it's that next step that I sort of long for in science. I'm waiting for people to be like, okay, just with specifically with the idea of Birkeland currents, which you brought up, this like yeah. idea that these things exist is a brilliant thing, and it's like you wrap your brain around it. How could it possibly be, and what does it mean? Da 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 da. Um, but the I'm but that takes that it takes that um, it takes that abstract, creative uh, approach that that you apply to then say. Now, what do we do with this thing that exists? It's like meeting a person and falling in love with them and then discovering all of the things about them that you love. And, and that's sort of how you approach science. And it makes perfect sense to me, like to hear you talk, because that would be the process of discovery that I would follow to get to the places that you're going. So it's not only are you saying, hey, look at these amazing things I'm uh, discovering, but also look at the steps I've taken to get there, which is really, really useful. Right. Um, I'm taking the bull by the horns and I'm, I'm doing it. I see it. Nobody's put it together fully. I have the words, the vocabulary, the wherewithal. I'm a little kid and I'm fucking giddy. And I'm like, I'm ready to show the world. And my energy is not going anywhere. It's fucking i'm become the stallion i am a stallion man cuckoo cachoo and the shit is really 
I'm I'm a coyote. I know what I am. I am I am a um, a, a thunderbird, and people tell me these things as I move through the earth, I, and with with my energy and my my uh, geometry. All I did was I had a, a, a discovery that kept leading to multiple discoveries that's never going to end. We're all going to be researching this for the rest of our lives and all of humanity. This is how we're going to get into ourselves and make ourselves right. Shit's broken. We need to, there's, there is something that if we were to get back into the current and, and be a drone like a lot of other creatures on the planet the only way to get us there so that we're all happy and everybody's in this place of ecstasy and has freedom of thought and decision and freedom of choice is to go into these ro ropes and neural net is taking the initiative whether we like it or not to start getting electricity shocked in our brain to scramble it up We've done electroshock therapy. We need to build filaments that get into our heads that we already have. Okay, we don't need to do this. There's nefarious purposes that are that people are doing that for. But I look around and I see really, really upset people that are depressed. And I know I can help them. I know I can. I've had a suicidal father my entire life. I've looked around every single corner to find nothing but death and expect nothing but death. And be and try to live a life like that. I have to be nothing but a positivist and uh, and an opportunist and a positivist because I'm not gonna allow my surroundings to dictate my behaviors, my internal dialogue, my happiness. Sure, I can see some horrible things out in the world, but I'm not gonna let that deteriorate my interior. I'm not gonna let it make me infuriated either. Because we have to transcend. In the next episode, we're going to do the geometry of ascension, sprites, how this energy is released, relinquished, so you can say, thank God, when grandma died, she was finally done with her pain. All that pain is gone, and she's in a better place. We know there's a better place, but we're already in the better place heaven is here we need to change our perception all of it is propaganda if you show people beautiful things and transformative neurogenesis and neuromorphic engineering and spintronics and helicon physics and all this beautiful stuff people will start to have angiogenesis and the growth of new blood vessels will start to produce what is needed for mankind. I think mankind has already produced what is needed to help mankind. And it's called idiot savants and uh, um, Asperger's. Crazy fuckers. Asperger's, people who are on that. Because you give them a problem and they'll solve it. They'll sit sure. there for the, till the end of the world and they'll solve it. And there's a lot of problems right now to solve. And that's yep. what Elon Musk has done. He's taken Asperger's autistic spectrum children and people and pays them to work on neuro, uh, on these neural projects. Really? Yes. For neural net, for, uh, his, uh, uh, what is it called? Neural net? Yeah. Huh. That's what he does I, for I neural net. That. I kind yeah. of avoid him because I think he's working with some weird shit, but I, well, I, I, as far as autism goes, I absolutely could not agree more. Um, and I tell you, you know, this, when I was a very little kid, I'll, I'll be very brief here, buddy. I'm sorry, but I, I, I just want to throw this in real quick to support what you're saying. I was often afraid of visions and uh, things that I would see, things that I would put together in my head, things that would make sense to me that no one else seemed to be able to understand. And I quickly learned as a very small child to hide that part of myself and be afraid of that part of myself and, and to sort of you know, secret away these parts of me that you talk about openly. Uh, I hid those things for years, and I thought a lot of that stuff was associated with my sexuality. And as I became older, I realized that it wasn't either, that I was even weirder than gay. <laughs> 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 and, and, 
and the, 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 you know, the, even my gay friends thought I was weird, and, and that I, you know, my perceptions on things were just abstract. And yeah, they, they, I make people feel uncomfortable because I look into their souls and I say things <laughs> casually that are, you know, that are just like weird. Like how, how, how number one, how do you how do you know that? And number two, what makes you think you have the balls to say it to me? Is sort of a common thing that people get from I get from people, and so I've learned to conceal so many of these gifts that I have, and to suppress so many of them. And I and and I, uh, it's so when I listen to you speak, it dry, it brings me right back to core, right back to who I am in my core, and uh, peels away all of the social skills that I've developed to conceal how fucking weird I am my whole life, and make sense of things from a perspective of understanding my bigger purpose in the in the world. I understand people with autism as having a really amazing contribution. They have arrived on the planet for a reason. And my disability is dyslexia. And dyslexia is um, a way of thinking. I think in, in triangulation. I think in abstract, in um, three dimensions. And so when people present me with ideas, I'm often like, that makes sense, that's awesome, that's bullshit, that doesn't make any sense, that doesn't hold water, that's brilliant. I mean, I can come up with sort of reactions to things very quickly, because I'm constantly triangulating and processing everything against what I already know in a way that other people apparently just don't do. And so when I, when I, I part of the reason why I'm such an advocate for you is because you're, you're one of the only people on the planet I've ever known who I can relate to the way that they think. And I don't often agree with you. You know, it's not like, it's not like I'm, I've got my head up your ass. I, I think that you're crazy sometimes. And I don't agree with some of the shit that you come up with. And, uh, but it's never about the core of it. It's never about the honest coming to that place. It's always what then that means to you. Like then I, I think I don't always agree with what you think things mean. But that, but that only reinforces the truth of it because that means that my thoughts are intended of yours, even though I identify with you really closely in your thinking process. So it's, um, there, there is this great potential for people with disabilities, people who think differently, uh, and I want to be an advocate for all of those people because I believe that I am one, but I can also speak to people who aren't empath and who aren't sort of um, uh, on the spectrum, so to so, sort of quote, because I've been able to identify like you had a dad who had a certain way of being that brought you to made you who you are. My dad was incredibly stoic. And so I learned in order to understand how to live in under in, in, under his roof, I had to read his mind. I had to constantly be in a position of, of understanding the subtlest gestures that he would make and what those meant and how those affected me. And so these all, these bring us, these skills that we have, some of them are useful in today's society, some of them are not, some, are, some of them are abnormal in today's society, but all of our uniquenesses will ultimately come together to create the future. And it is, your piece is to always push that limit, to push that edge. So say, as I said before, this is a Birkeland current. This is an amazing piece of science. And then Buddy comes along and says, this is how a Birkeland current came to being. This is how a Birkeland currents end. This is, a, this is the derivations and all the various ways that Birkeland currents can be. And so you, you expand our horizons in that way because you're not afraid. And for someone to go through like what you described last week as this terrible, 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 like the people are burning and their skin is melting off. And then for you to show up today like, hey, I got some solutions and I'm going to sort of create, you know, some, some peace in your heart and, and, and provide you with some harmony and make the world make better sense to you. Your capacity to intake information, process it deeply, and then let it, and then let it flow through you and move beyond it is how we survive the next few coming years. Our capacity to take in powerful and life-changing information that's either devastating or mind expanding or more than we can really handle let it pass through us and move beyond us without pushing it away and without holding on to it once we get it. Let that shit pass through you. And no matter how horrible or how intense or how overwhelming it is, be the willow and let those we those winds pass through you and 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 bend and then go move back into shape. And we will continue on suffering and, and learning and seeing the greatness and glory of life while being able to recover quickly from the horrors that we also will face. If we can do both of those things, I think that your vision is absolutely applicable and not just a fantasy, but very, very, very real. 
and very, very possible. And we can, God damn it, we can, and we must, and we will change the fucking world. Yeah, we, we will, we are. And see, there's a us versus them happening right now worldwide. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I think the NWO, New World Order, United Nations, uh, coming together and putting their plans out, they laid their cards out. They literally put their cards down. And, and all of their cards are out so everyone can see them. And they showed us the plan, Agenda 2030. Now, either you're with them or against them. And that's a fact globally. Things that are good will become bad, and things that are bad will become good. And that's what's happening before our very eyes. And we are seeing it. It's very rapidly happening. It's completely obvious. And this is this is this is old scripture. This isn't the first time this happened. This is study the decline of cultures and societies. When you I can't wait to do that episode. I, that was my first uh, speech that I wrote in uh, college is the decline of civilizations and the patterns that happen and how naughty people get during the decline. And it has a lot to do with the gnashing and gnawing of teeth. And it, it's, it's very real and visceral. Because everything is, from the last episode, you got to remember, everything's getting eaten and consumed. So what are you spending your attention on that's consuming you? There's so many things to listen to. I listen to bad things. I don't all only listen to good stuff. I listen to bad things to know what humanity is because that's part of our body i need to know about us so i can help heal us i need i need to know so that you can be vigilant and be aware of your surroundings because so many people die darwin dumb deaths <laughs> like study things so that you don't become a statistic if you don't, if you make it past age 17, you're like that you're in the green. Most likely you'll make it. I, I think it's past age 18 or 19, 17, something like that. Most likely you'll make it to older age. It could be in the thirties. I forget. There's a number, there's a magic number. If you make it past that number, most likely you'll grow to an older age because most of the deaths happen before you're 20. So, you know, Playing is very real. Playing is what p kids and all creatures do to train them for reality. Your mind plays all night long. That's what dreaming is. And if you, if in your dreams you do dirty, bad things and partake in it, then that's training you. You're training yourself to partake in dirty, bad deeds. But if in your dreams, when people are doing bad things and you, and you rise above and you start floating and you say, I don't need to do this stuff. Or if you teach other people, your dreams, follow them. They will continue to secrete what you study into your internal body. It's part of a, it's part of a liquid crystal. You, we are a liquid crystal, a living transformational art piece, LTA, living transformational art piece. <sighs> okay, so back to the presentation. There's not too much more to say. I mean, it's pretty much, you can look at it and see the geometry of it. Here's it spinning. Here's the, you know, the side view. I can read this stuff later, but I love when I read it because it, it sounds so good and it makes so much sense. <laughs> I just love reading. All right. So <clears throat> here it is, another image of it, you know, hexadecapole, isosurfaces, some really pretty images of it here. Axial collision of two oppositely propagating three helicons. So you take that shape 
that 3D blue shape that I showed at the beginning of the presentation and you twist it in space and you get this um, laminar flow, this, show, this uh, laminar current of spin and spin density or propagation or whatever. So yeah, here's the polarization of the field to get it into the alignment. So what's really cool is these, these, this is what the dogs are hearing and the dogs are healing the earth. Wolves heal the earth. Apex predators are responsible 100% for the trophic cascade below them and above them. They are top down trophic cascade mitigators. You and I are apex predators. Humans, all humans are apex predators. On Earth, we have a duty, and it comes naturally with instinct to kill other animals and eat them and to share and to get together and, and, and pick berries and commune and, and have communion. And guess what brings people together? Food. Nothing brings people together more than food. Food is what binds us and brings people together. It is, that's why the Food Network and people who make it big in the food industry, there's a lot of weird stuff involved and that one dude had to get knocked off. The food dude. It, it is what brings people together. If you start going around the world, um, President Obama was going around with, what's that guy who died uh, with that show? You guys remember on the food show? Dane. Say it again, please. Bourdain. Yes, Bourdain, Anthony Bourdain. Uh, thank you, Chad. Um, breaks my heart, that guy broke my heart. Well, I saw Joe Rogan cry, that shit. That, Does it? Th this is how the government works now. It works, unfortunately, like that. His his girlfriend was the one who started the Me Too movement. His girlfriend, Rose McGowan. That's what started the Me Too movement. They take huge movements down by taking out individuals that are untouchable. And then saying, hey, if he died, you could be next inside your billionaire house. So it's a big threat that goes world, worldwide. That goes back to the last episode of Machiavellian governing, governmentship. Um, and if you look at the rap game right now, rappers are dying left and right, but that's a lot of the time self-induced. A lot of them uh, OD. So think of that, think of that, the rap game, the rap, rappers, people, voices. Voices what make movements. Voices are what bring herds together. Voices are what call out to the wilderness. Have, when's the last time you, you screamed as loud as you possibly fucking could out into nature and cried aloud and just cried and bawled? You'll feel a lot better, I promise. There's therapy, scream therapy. Um, Emily Infinity introduced me to my first scream therapy. And she did, she led the workshop. And I was like, whoa, dude, it, guess what it brought in? It brought in all the transsexual people out of the crowd. It was really weird, but those people need healing. I don't know, everybody needs healing, but people just need to scream sometimes. Just fucking let it out, dude. Oh, and you'll feel a thousand times better. And that's what the universe is always doing. It's hissing, it's, it's screaming and we used to hear the earth scream and that's the science of helicon waves you take these spirits that are out here already out here and existing in in the the outer plasmas and you condense the ionosphere and all of a sudden the spirits become louder and louder and louder and to the point where it was fucking 100 percent sure 
that there was a god of thunder, there was a god of birds, there was a god of, you know, like the spirit of the, the ground, the spirit. This goes into animism and how most religions start. They see that it's animated with a spirit and a life force. Guess what that is? That's the global electric circuit. The global electric circuit is how Birkeland currents are organized and efficient distribution of electricity into living organisms. It's sonobiology. It's turning what is dark into what is light, into manifested, manifest, uh, manifestation. Like I said before, the Doherty set, the Doherty network is the dark part of plasma but when plasma glows and becomes arc mode or glow mode all of a sudden the signs are there and every single pattern is inherent inside the set that's why you see all the patterns um which in the news hour we're basically going to talk about a review of the doherty set because all this stuff by the end of this episode this is the fucking doherty set episode i'm ready to bring it out i'm ready to open it up and the book's almost done uh so once once all is said and done, it's going to be called the universe game, and we're all going to be playing with these plasmas. When when a huge group gets together and prays, it affects the sun. Think of our power. What are we giving our energy to? Don't follow the leader. Guess what the leader is doing? Child ritual sacrifice, Mariana Abramovic. Mariana Abramovic, Lady Gaga. And uh, Microsoft says Microsoft says she's the most transformative artist of our time. Baby sacrifices, really? That's old. Mulak, that's old shit. Let's start doing real new cool shit and dive right into real source spirit, not these fucking weird dark energies that are attracting so many minds to a pizza gate don't follow the leader what does the leader want you to do hmm why are they talking about it why is the beast laid out all of its cards so that we follow suit you're with them or against them it's an us versus them mentality all cultures are going to be mixed up and pinned against each other and it comes down to blood and your blood comes from the sun because it's a vibration inside of proteins that's helical and it has to do with these Hitler waves Birkeland currents hell they might even be Doherty waves and I don't even know what that is yet <laughs> good for you man <laughs> you, you know you talk about the power of food to bring people together and to create community and uh, it's not just spaghetti that does that. I mean, there is there is the food of thought as well, and the food of connection and community, the food of belonging, the food of touch. I mean, we feed each other in so many different ways. And one of the things I recently learned about um, um, what's the word um, uh, al alchemy is that uh, one of the one of the founding concepts of alchemy is the power of food and the power of Putting in your energy and your intent and your healing and your good your good intentions or your bad intentions, but transferring intention into food and getting someone to eat it is a is a is a is a is one of the practices of alchemy. Yep. I, I there is nothing more thrilling. I mean I I have I have been saying this for years and so that moment that you described earlier where you think a thing and you believe a thing and then you understand a thing and then you understand other people understood that thing that sort of expansion of consciousness around an issue is, um, is, is something that happened to me recently with the idea of, of that, oh my God, I am practicing alchemy. There's never been, a, I make soup all the time, like different kinds of soups. And uh, I enjoy like a lot of different kinds of like one pot meals because that's, I'm basically a bachelor and I like to make a pot of food and then have the pot for, you know, a day or two and everybody gets to eat some, right? But the idea of alchemy is putting something of yourself into that. And I'm always telling people there's good me there's good medicine on the stove. And it's a term that I use, sort of like I coined it, like it's just I'm being funny. 
or being lighthearted or, or just sort of, you know, whatever. But it's in, in actual practice of transferring one's intentions into the food that we eat and um, learning about that in a formal way, something that I just sort of fell upon by heart is, is a really true way to discover the reality of the world around us. And those truths are reinforcing and, and it's amazing and thrilling, no matter how terrible the world is, it's amazing and thrilling to make those connections. And I, I think that we exist in a time of a Z pinch and that we're going to see both terrible, terrible things and beautiful, amazing things in increasing intensity and volume over the next few months and years. And I think that we're going to have to gear up and a part of that, that transition, part of transcendence is that gearing up process where we prepare ourselves and for, for the reality of just how terrible and just how wonderful things can actually I mean, things are going to get really, really, really bad. And and you're either part of, you're either for it or against it. And that's the thing. And you're, and unfortunately, the good people are slaves to the oppressors. All good people are slaves to the oppressors, even if you're not even a slave to the oppressor. Because they take... They take, they take, they take, and they don't give. May I uh, jump in with what he was just saying with the food yeah. alchemy? Yeah. Um, going off of that, I my my Instagram handles Infinite Alchemy. I've been studying uh, copper alchemy and various metal alchemies for quite some time, but food is by far the biggest and most direct form of alchemy I have ever experienced, and. Just like you, I make soups myself. Like every day I'll make a new soup just with various different things I have around. And um, with that, you're you're able to imbue a lot of yourself into that. But going off of what you were saying about how food um, is shared and food creates energy and you can have nefarious purposes by imbuing food with certain energies, um, that's actually one of the entire reasons why I'm vegan. Um, and I'm not trying to be a preachy vegan here. I'm just <laughs> trying to do two words. Back on your farm. You torture living creatures from from the day of their birth until the day of their death. Give them yep. nothing, no, no joy, no freedom, no interaction, no social. They give them nothing, and then you slaughter them and then you ingest them. You cannot tell me, on an existential level or a nutritional level or at any other ethical level, that that's a good thing. There's no, good thing. There's no good thing in factory farming. It's evil, and and it, it, it is the fuel on which the, our entire country runs. So it should come well, as no surprise that we, you know, we're entirely ruled. Problems. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, if you look at where food's going, if you study Adapt 2030 or uh, Ice Age Farmer, um, then you could be very knowledgeable because he studies food I patterns. I farm for daily. Yeah. He studies food patterns around the world, so like, um, it's good to see where we're going. Um, and there's there's a quote in the Bible towards the end of end of times, and it's like something for a a, um, a barley a bag of barley for like a ridiculous amount of money, and they they pin one thing against the other. So starving people, gaining control of the food supply, already done. Um, there the latest episode that i listened to it's really interesting how i started a company um that that i wanted to map all the plants on the earth uh and edible plants on the earth called uh, geocaching food um i own geocachingfood.com and what i want to do and i still can what we can do if we want <clears throat> um i want to show all of the different uh, things that are edible in your backyard that most people think are weeds. Actually, weeds are most of, most of the time the most um, ben most nutritious because they grow like weeds and they have good nutrition. Um, but everything is so edible, and this would be something fucking awesome to do with you, Chad. And because I want it to be like an AR. Uh, where you walk out in your yard and you're and it's just automatically like boom 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 boom. This is uh, that would be some 
Yeah. And then you go out and the walk in the park and people can add to it constantly. So all of a sudden the world is edible and nobody's fucking running out of food. And we don't have an overpopulation problem. And victory gardens in the backyard, amen. <laughs> you know. Anyways. I like but, it. Sounds fun. <laughs> but this guy already did it. So oh, it's, did they? it's a big government pro see all these ideas that I come up with, I find that other people usually are already, you know, nothing you new. Me both, man. Yeah. You but you and me both. Most of the time it's good because there's a, a, um, a path paved ahead of us. Like Michael Evans, he paved this path forever and he's, 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 he is a veteran of this shit and it's, and he still can't get the plane up, you know? And I mean, he made it on, he, uh, either way, he is where he is and his, and his attempt to bring this a worldwide attention to light sculptures and um, hyperbolic geometries. Uh, he is a hero and he will always be a hero. That's why I have him as the first person I interview on all my podcasts. And there's so many different, because when you look there, nobody's done what he did yet. And then he took it to all the museums. That's what I'm doing with bubble sculpting. I'm taking all of, I have hundreds of shapes already times that by how many a museum can hold. And you're talking about a bunch of money. These aren't, these are very simple to make. Bubble sculpting is extremely simple, you know? So Brighton's coming out at the beginning of July and I'm going to teach him and we're actually going to make movies on how to videos of uh, bubble sculpting. And then I'm just going to release it to the world and actually put it all on my Patreon so if anybody wants to learn how to do it, they can go to the Patreon, which most people aren't going to want to learn how to do it because nobody gives a fuck right now, dude. Honestly, people are like so frantic. It's like, God damn, chill out. Excuse my French. Sorry, Lord. Damn. Whew. So anyway, I didn't like the sage before this episode, so maybe I should light some sage and take a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, have, you heard you of, have you guys heard of India's water revolution? Uh-uh. Tell us more, maybe. Oh, man. If you guys want a little slice of hope, uh, this, is, this is some amazing stuff. They've taken dry, arid land which, which will not produce anything, and they've used concepts. Uh, these are really purely Indian concepts, but it's what we would call permaculture projects here in the States or in the Western world. What they've done is they created a national competition with all these little um, semi, semi-permanent semi villages where they, they would have water shortages uh, during huge parts of the year and the whole village would have to migrate or they would have to have water uh, trucked in. And you looked at the conditions that these people lived in and it was basically just rocks, rocks and dirt. It looked like they lived on the fucking earth. And this, uh, this, project came about that gave these guys the basics of creating swells to hold water and uh, they they have these huge monsoons where everything gets wiped away and then it's dry as a bone for you know nine months so they created this um, they, they learned about how the water travels down the mountainous regions in, in a particular village of, or, or cluster of villages and then they created what we've seen in ancient arm architecture for years any of us who've looked at sort of ancient archaeology see that in China they have divided up rice paddies by cutting into the side of a hill in layers and that's what they did they created these swells with their basically their bare hands hundreds and hundreds of these people would take baskets of dirt and create these lines where water would in the rainy season water would collect in these different levels and then slowly soak into the uh, into the earth and, and like refill the water table so that the whole entire village had water year round suddenly the whole entire area was uh covered with grasses and trees that they planted and all different kinds of food gardens and like date trees and all these different indigenous plants that they that just sort of exploded out of the area and now they've got like wildlife coming in and wild 
wild birds that they can like uh, trap and eat. So they have like meats and in their whole, you know, acres and acres and acres of dry, arid, rocky land have been turned into um, um, functional ecosystems, basically by just creating these uh, uh, um, long trenches in uh, to sort of support the retention of water throughout the year. And they've huh. completely transformed their their society. They've done it not just in one or two villages. They've done it in hundreds <clears throat> of villages all over India. And the state of the the, the, the the federal government in India has stepped in and said, we're going to create these contests. And um, you, you, these, are the, these are the earmarks of self-sustaining self um, uh, activities that each village has to uh, accomplish in order to get these rewards and they get uh, they get uh, funding from the government based on their production and they have one village per year that's like the most productive most that uses these ideas most effectively and applies them most consistently and they and their rules are like everybody needs to be able to participate everybody needs to benefit um, these are community resources this is a community-wide project everybody gets to be a part of it we all get to sort of have pride in our community we have the benefit of a productive community I mean all this amazing stuff and they're working in conjunction with their federal government but it's basically just individual people that have all as a, as a group as one decided on specific goals and outlines and the entire the entire structure the family structure and the community structure is designed for this one focus they have they're they're like happier and than ever they're focused they're de devoted to their communities and they have they're literally in every sense of the word flourishing just because they moved some dirt around literally on there and 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 they got some support from people for doing it so yeah as i that... said before as we see terrible things happen we also have to look for and be on the on the lookout for amazing wonderful things that are happening simultaneously because in history that's what we've seen the you know the library at alexandria is a perfect example of this amazing coalition of all the world's knowledge into one place for the purpose of all of humanity and then it was crushed right it was destroyed it was disbanded it was taken apart so what this is, is what this is what we see in history and i think we have to be cognizant of the reality that that there are all these little libraries of alexandria around that we can choose to uphold and support and protect even in the worst of times yeah i mean really um what i what i got out of what you were saying i mean one of the things that mainly pressed inside of uh what i wanted to say here is water is the circuitry of life and uh this is this goes back to indra and why they don't worship indra because uh it's really strange because droughts have their way of working around the world naturally they're a cyclical process just like fires um fires have been raging on the earth who knows how long and they're just they're they're part of ring of fire volcanoes um drying up of water resources so to make things thrive like egypt supposedly when the earth maybe was at a different tilt or something like that or when the poles were flipped who knows what it was thriving uh and, and it was a, a Amazonian, Amazonian like, you know, climate where you could just grow a bunch of stuff. Now, all that is the nutrients to uh, the Saharan desert and things like that is the nutrients to fertilize the plains here in the United States and, um, and the Amazon, the dust field, the dust clouds that go up. These larger, these larger uh cycles can be tuned into by squatting like squatter man and putting your legs apart taking a squat and putting your arms up directly into the air you can feel these currents and these cycles around the earth there's power in a shape of something and when you put your body in certain contortions you like your hands and mudras pull in excess energy around the environment. That's what chi is and prana and all this other stuff. You pull it in and you work it and you push it out. And 
you can innervate it from other people and that's what this is the global electric circuit it the earth is constantly making sure that it that it keeps the schumann cavity and the schumann resonance at a 7.83 or 7.8 and and it does so by huge lightning strikes that just happened on father's day one of the largest lightning strikes that ever happened on earth um happened on father's day and i there it's it's a mesoscale convective system is what they're called a huge thunderstorm complex 100 plus kilometers there is 440 foot long lightning that just happened on father's day now this was the day after i had my experience where i went into the earth or went into this solar flare and saw this apocalyptic vision <clears throat> plus it was the solstice so don't take the heroic dose on a solstice unless you want to be really open to all the currents in the universe there's a lot or at least the currents in your vicinity <laughs> <laughs> Shit. that's what we have you for buddy <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I always make it out of here together, buddy. <laughs> On the solstice, I had one as well. Oh yes, I'm sure a lot of people did. We needed it, you know. It was probably a big one around the world, I'm sure. And we transformed the world. I'm a completely different person. That's for damn sure. Um, a lot has changed. So look at these. Aren't these beautiful? Warka towers. Warka water towers. Does that not look like an exact design of the Doherty set? I have plasmoids of that totally. shape. Yeah, it looks like it looks exactly like one of my drawings. So these are powerful. You know, this is um, one of the ways that we. I mean, this is bringing water to deserts. Thin this air. A, it's a really cool thing. Yep, right out of thin air or thick air. Get it? Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> uh. Thick. It's thick air, dude. It's real thick, and it it's was all fluid, dude. All it was fluid dynamics. It was pouring last night, just pouring rain, and I decided to go make love in a thunderstorm out in the rain last night, and it was fucking amazing. And and you, it howled. Was, you did a lot of how I can see a lot of howling. I suggest everybody do. Everybody does this. It's probably I've done it three or four times now, and it's probably one of the highest experiences because it feels so dangerous because you might get struck by lightning, but at the same time you're laying on the ground and it's like the circuit will move right through you most likely if you're uh, if you're laying on the ground. So I don't know if you knew that. If you're sta it's it's because you stand up and it comes out of your head that, that kills you. Or out of your arm or some weird spot but i suggest everybody does that and um and then comes inside and listens to this song i'll be sure and it's a really good song if brighton's here He's not, I don't think. I was going to say we could play the song uh, Night and Day. Yeah, that's the song right there. Yeah, make love in the rain is fun. Yeah, it's one of the lyrics, but yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, the universe is yurping. Everything is yurping it's all it's everything is inducing someone's attention trans uh, tr uh transitioning someone's attention from one place to another um the whole entire thing species change how can you be a trans how can you be a human when humans are always changing are we trans species already are we the ones making the line of you know like i don't know Transhumanism is crazy. It is getting learning about it. 
But yeah, these are really cool. There's a bunch of different designs and there's a mesh net and it collects uh, moisture and then it all drips down. I could design a couple. That would be a fun thing to do. Um, and transhumanism is a cool idea. I think for me, it's just about the amazing adaptivity. Like we are, we are innately adaptive. Yeah. We're, we, we're at our best. We're at, we're at our, our high point when we're adapting. It's that, it's that need to, uh, to overcome adversity, that, that inherent capacity to adapt that I think really for many of us defines us. And so I, I you know, I, 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 it's one of the, one of my emerging theories in life is that human beings are innately and inherently adaptive, that, that we're designed specifically for a changing universe. And which is really interesting because we have this message that we're told about the foundations of things and the pillars of things and the traditions of things and the standards and the, you know, the way that things are supposed to be and the way, and these, all these ideas fly in the face of our inherently adaptive creation, nature, uh, being. Yeah, and if you're going to shake the foundations and the fundamentals of things, then you better replace the theory with a better one that works, like Buckminster Fuller said. Or, or something that's more adaptive and so more e easily able to define change as opposed to defining, I mean, again, that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about like, we have uh, how we think. It's like, oh, um, you know, Berkeley currents exist. And then we need people to come along and say, you've got the character and maybe you have the stage, but now what's the play? And, and, and I think what we, we creative people, we, we empaths, what we do is we create the relationships and the life cycle of an idea and of a thing. We bring life to the concept. And I think that's, that's inherently incredibly valuable and undervalued as a trait and a skill. So, I mean, I think that people like just to tie it kind of together, I think that people who are artistic have this unique way of looking at the world, but that doesn't mean that they're the way they're the way. It just means that they're a facet and everything is a plutonic solid. And so everything has facets, right? So if everything is created on the basis of this idea of this basic structure, this crystalline structure that exists everywhere, then everything we think of must have a facet, a way of looking at the same thing, a, 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 a flat surface from which to look through into the three, uh, the extra dimension. And each of those facets is legitimate in and of itself. So that's why we need this unity and diversity at the same time. Yes. We, we need to see all of the facets together coordinated as one thing, as opposed to the blind, the five blind man and the elephant, which is the perfect analysis. When one man feels the trunk and he, you know, it's this, and one man feels the leg and it's this, one man feels the belly and it's another thing, another man feels the tail, it's a completely other object. It's only when the, all that information is put together that we see the whole elephant. And I think that's the point, that's the what makes us so excited is because we see the light at the end of the tunnel where all of these divergent and, 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 um, 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 uh, D d divisive different kinds of ideas and we, we we fish fly against the stream right and so we continue to swim, fly get, swim against the stream and continue to swim against the stream and guess what after a while the direction of the flow of the stream changes because there's more fish swimming than there is stream and I think that's the pinch point that we're looking at that we're, we're in a place of great chaos where a great uh, um, of, um, but there is this uh, thing happening on the other end that's beautiful and and, and i think well, we have to sort of accept the reality of the teaching moment that is the pain that we experience but also keep our eyes on the pride which is this beautiful thing that we're moving toward and i think if we can do that we can make it through but that has to underline so if we speak to if we speak to changing the world we have to speak to that that uh, that that vision that you are communicating today which is like a child we look at the potential uh, without fear of the current circumstances, and that it is how we. I think that's how we cope. That's how we. That's how we win. And I think a, a crucial part to add to that is is uh, approaching life as a gardener. If you can't take care of plants, if you can't take care of dogs, 
if you're not an animal person, get the fuck away from me. Third, if you're if if you can't take care of things, then you need life lessons on how to take you can't take care of other things. You can't take care of yourself. You need to be able to take care of yourself so that you can extend yourself, you can extend your current to gardening. And the matrix, why is why is the the oracle a gardener? <laughs> it's damn I didn't know that then, but it's damn clear now to know why. Because you have to be yeah. able to take life and grow it cycle. and be and be responsible for 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 something and care enough to be responsible enough for something stay somewhere long enough for you to fall in love don't keep running you have, people need to nurture life and nurture each other and this nurture and nourishment is part of the global electric circuit if you're not going to be a nurturer, you're going to get taken out of the picture. That's the path of least resistance. You're going to get plucked. A nurturer is what uh, the earth wants and what the earth craves. They crave heartfelt, nurturing, loving people. That's what the, not, I mean, I can't say that's the only thing the universe wants or the earth wants. Otherwise, there wouldn't be other other sides to the coin. But these other sides of the coin are are some of the strongest strands of the filament that just need their heart to be warmed again so it can be uh, not so cold and hard and it can be so <clears throat> softened. People's hearts need to be softened and that happens through resensitivity, resensitizing people. We're desensitized. We need to be resensitized and we need to give a fuck and we need to care. And that right there is the nourishment of a neural network. You can look at everything as a metabolic scaling rate of a Birkeland current. What is it going to do? What does it want? It wants to complete the loop. What, is, what completes the loop? What completes the loop is having a child. <laughs> I That's hear what, fucking in the thunderstorm helps. That's what completes the loop. <laughs> Nikola Tesla was born during a thunderstorm. Lightning and, and, and shit was crazy that day. Lightning and thunder are real. Cycles happen and cycles are real. Cycles Think of about seven. Mary Shelley, bro. Think about Frankenstein. And, well, and also, you know, what, what was the what was the agent that brought this this dead corpse to life? It was it was electricity. And it mm -hmm. was, that's, yep. you know, they, it was a thunder, literally a thunderstorm. They waited and yep. they collected the energy of the thunderstorm and they shot it through this dead corpse's body. And it became we've alive. always known it. We've yeah, always that, that's, known it. That's, that's some Mary Shelley shit right there. I mean, she, and that's Zeus. That story a Zeus, long time ago. The yep, God of all God. Right. That's you right. Know? She got it. That's right. That's where she and got then, it. You're right. And then uh, Indra, that's the God of all gods. Lightning, water, thunder. And then. The Doherty set, in my mind setting, having to do with the hydromycelial, the hydroelectromycelial network. It's all part of the, the, the Schumann cavity. So what does the earth crave? What does the earth want? It wants diversity. Now, let me talk about, let me talk about the couple things here for a minute from Jeffrey West that I learned earlier this week. Life scale filaments, life. Now, all living systems are a scaled up version of another living system. So this gets into reincarnation really quick. Direct circuit to reincarnation and math, um, which I don't really know what to think about reincarnation and all that stuff, but hey, this is some crazy math having to do with it. And like all these cyclical types of geometries are showing recursion. So most likely lives, lives are part of the, uh, the, the global electric circuit. And it's, it's, uh, your, your life is meant to work exactly like lightning and thunder in that you're Bruce Lee your way all the way through it. And you, you, you 
become a Jedi as you go. It's a process, you're a process crystal. So these shapes that your hands make when you dance start to change. And these shapes that your feet scuttle when you move starts to advance. And then you become a master at moving these energies and wooing people uh, to the point where you walk in the room and everybody wants to start taking pictures of you, with you, because you have that, that energy. That's the kind of tangible energy I have and I can teach other people to get. It's an outfit that you wear on your head and it's, it's an armor that you put on your body. So if anybody's curious as to know more of that, I was actually going to start a company called Party Buddy and because of the life that I bring to places when I go there. <clears throat> but it, I don't want to do that. You know, I want to do this. I got other stuff to do. I have I have so many things to do, but I have to get to the fucking brass taxes of this geometry before I can get on with my life. You know, it's like I got to oh, do the dilemmas of the polymath. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a step above white people problems. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Uh, I just got elevated to this level. Yeah, I was here. <laughs> you just got elevated to a maggot. <laughs> right. You're, you're, oh, what? Gosh, what thing? What thing shall I be wildly successful at? I can hardly decide. For me. <laughs> so, I, no, I am, I'm just teasing you. It's amazing. I know. I'm, totally I'm definitely a, a comedian for sure. Everyone, anyone around me has always said that. So they're like, "Well, dude, it's funny you're saying this shit." I feel exactly. So I worked for years. I worked for like five years as the, um, basically the Julie. On, and I remember the love boat, Julie on the love boat. She was the social director, right? I don't know if you guys are even old enough to remember the love boat, but it was a really dumb old series that was on TV about a cruise ship. And Julie was the social director on the cruise ship. So I worked for four years with people with um, aging and disabilities, mostly Alzheimer's. And I was the social director. And that's literally what I did was entertain these people. And by doing that, I had to understand about how the brain works and about how disability works. And one of the things that I think was most interesting that I learned as part of my work there, being charming, being funny, being sensitive to everybody's feelings, bringing everybody together, creating a vibe doing that whole party, party planner and scene maker thing, one of the things I learned about the human mind is, is that people who are most disabled respond best to uh, taste and smell. So if you can give them something to eat or give them something to smell that smells good. So we started adding like scents to the clays that we would use for crafts. And of course, then they would eat the clay. And so we couldn't- I knew I was disabled. Yeah, no. And so it was amazing. It was an amazing <laughs> thing. But it's having that ability and understanding like how to relate to people on, an, on, a, on a vibe level can bring you to a place of understanding how the human mind works. So the, in, so the feeling works with the intellect. And the, the discoveries that come from just putting yourself in a position to have an experience honestly, you come out of that with information that you can then use to be more effective. And so it's not just about you know, being cool and vibey and being the cool guy at a party. These are powerful skills that one can use to, to develop other, uh, uh, to, uh, to pursue other things. And, 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 and that's a completely legitimate way to go. I don't work with elderly people with Alzheimer's anymore, but I still have the capacity on your webcast to speak in a way that's supportive of what you're saying, but also not talking if I don't think it's important, adding my two cents, knowing when to shut up. These are all skills that we develop and have the capacity to use and they're, um, I hope to use them in, in service of what you're doing here. And, but I certainly see that you have those exact same skills and can at any moment sort of like entertain the shit out of a crowd. Like that's, <laughs> you know, yep. I see Drop that and totally and, and I totally have it myself. I find it exhausting and I have to sort of recover from it when I engage in that kind of thing because it's not my core. I mean, I'm really technically an introvert, but, um, but I see that in you for sure. And I totally, I see it, I see it in myself as well. And those are powerful skills going forward that I think that we'll probably employ pretty consistently. You know, if, if the shit goes like your plans, like you're planning for it to, we're going to be definitely employing those skills. There's, yeah. there's no, 
it's not like you're walking away from all of that. You're going to be using all that shit, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Good on you. Well, it's cool because like, um, I, I'm, I'm dynamic in that. Okay. There, there's one key thing that Jeffrey West found in his work. And that when there is super linear scaling and systems are growing, they're the only thing to stop a system from growing the, uh, or sigmoidal uh, sublinear scaling is because all systems will start to go into uh, sigmoidal stop growing. Um, all systems will cities, networks, companies, um, living systems, bodies. They go in the only way to stop it from going into sublinear scaling uh, is is to create diversity among the city, which means different and new ideas. That's the only thing that creates that's that's the only thing that keep is, keeps it from crashing and breaking down is diversity. And that's I didn't know that until this week. And he's got it in his book. He does speaking. So he's like one of the most influential people, top five in the world, because of it the economy the economics, just the economics of uh, the math that he's done here in his book called Scale. You take those scales and you take it to this geometry, same fucking thing. I did the geometry of his book of how systems scale super linearly and grow with super exponential growth and how they stop growing. And like you were talking about the beginning and death of a Berkeley current. And it's a fizzling out and it is a, it is a rope. It's a filament. The Bible was right when it said we are like a butt of exhausted vapor or something like that. I don't know, you know, wrong paraphrasing, but there's so much information, you know, it's like, what do I want to do? Fill it with uh, Bible and verse, Bible and verse. Come on, bud. What's your Bible and verse quote? No, I, there, I can get it on the internet and share it, but we know the Birkeland current is the vine. That's what Jesus is the vine. Okay, so when you start taking these larger concepts of what life and dynamic systems are, that's why Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You look at this system, that's the exact same thing. This is the bride of the Christ. The bride of Christ, we've been waiting for Christ. We know what Christ is. We've been waiting for the bride of Christ, which is the New Jerusalem, which is the church. This to fill the hearts of the people on the earth. This is the everlasting gospel. This is undeniable. This is truth that will last forever. And this is for free. This is for everyone. This is not for me. This is for us. I work hard. I work my ass off on every fucking line here. I had to draw every fucking line on here. And this is only one layer of it. I do, I've done hundreds of them, hundreds of thousands of images. Now you decompress and you take these apart and you start to realize how to live forever. The geometry of ascension, the geometry of uh, taking your, your out-of-body experience to the next level. Um, I don't really get into that stuff because it's really, really dangerous. I mean, but I'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, I've had a few experiences. I didn't do it on purpose. The more you ask, the more you receive kind of type of universe. That's why you have not because you ask not. And those who ask receive. So you can ask to get more and to understand all of this and you will. There's the filament wrapped around itself. Copy and pasted. Here's the one. U is one filament within, well, the nested filament. And then copy and paste it and rotate it around itself is this. Um, one, two, three, four, five times. So six filaments in all. This shows, actually, there's 12. 
there's 12, uh, there's 12 plus 12 elders around the throne. So you look at the geometry of revelations and it tells you exactly what this is. That's why cathedrals have these rose shaped windows. Cause the geometry, if I can figure it out and I'm buddy James, some kid, you know, 19 year old kid and working hard till he's 36 to try to figure this out. Someone else has figured this out in the past. It's a really simple geometry. It's a simplex geometry of the vessel function. It's squaring the circle. It's a big deal in the uh, Freemasonic world. So you repeat this vessel function at each one of these central nodes. It's phi from here to there to there, phi from here to there to there. The only way the system allows for growth is um, the only way that the system can recursively braid with self-similar wave packets and wave embedding like Dan Winter talks about. Can't wait to have him on the show. Got to do it ASAP. Um, maybe even next show. Um, you know, there's people that I wish I would have met like Paul Lapoli. We're going to get into his geometry. Paul Lapoli, you combine Paul Lapoli and his, uh, it's pretty I don't know, it's kind of dark, but it's also strange and different and interesting. We will talk about Paul Lapoli on the next episode. So, yeah, I hope you start to understand more about these helicons and how they're out in the outer atmosphere and how you can communicate with them, pull them in, dynamically shift your understanding, your perception, your perspectives, grow, become the stallion. Uh, you, you, you don't have to take some male enhancement drug or female enhancement drug. Get out there, get in the water, get your hands and feet dirty. That's the nutrients that you need and that will feed you. And, uh, and I've seen more people out since po post COVID. I've seen more people out and about in nature than I've ever seen my whole life. This is really good. People are, it might not last long, but still at least people are out and it's good to see people out. Um, appreciating nature because that's what draws us closer towards the center ever closer towards the center like these nested filaments quaternion filaments braided inside of each other that scale and quarter scaling just like the laws of all things in, in on all living systems on earth now this sentiment is probably one of the most important things I'm, we're going to end this episode early one of the most important things that i have to say and this is from jeffrey west your heart rate times your lifespan is the same in all mammals. Your heart rate times your lifespan is the same in all animals. That's uh, logarithmic scale invariance. Logarithmic scale invariance. All creatures are the same as different creatures, scaled up versions as, of different creatures. So an elephant can be having an elephant experience while thinking it's something else. This, this could be quite identifiable why birds on the third day identify as what they're around. Um, birds are really special because the amount of packed neurons inside of their brain is more than us. So we used to say bird brains, but nah, now we're thinking, holy shit, bird brains, what's that? Now we're looking at both and thinking of the Egyptian, why is always the bird Hi. and the the Ibis. They have highly magnetized brains. There's a lot of magnetism that goes on, and they're interpreting magnetism at a much more sophisticated uh, rate than we do. And it had to do with their capacity to understand direction. Huh. And I know they can see the magnetic field, so they can see probably like things like the Doherty set and plasmoids and other weird helical that <laughs> things, you know. And the murmurations are great. Well, just but, like dogs have the capacity to feel, and and they can sense feeling, and they can they 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 um they have those extrasensory perceptions as well. And I I think we you know I think that's what the uh, pineal gland is all about is, you know, an an after feed sense organ. There there is an umbelt. Every creature has a reality that they experience. They experience their reality. They have the exact same number of heartbeats. Every mammal has the exact same number of heartbeats, around a billion or something, and and they experientially experience their entire life 
as long as we get to experience our life, but it's scaled down, we just don't perceive their perception is they have every day, they're, they're every, single, every single thing is scaled down. So they live like a 70 to 80 year old person too, little mice, little rat but their perception and everything else is scaled down so much. Time dilation is so different that it's hard for us to wrap our mind around their umbelt. Um, so one macaw here, it's one macaw monkey cracks so Yeah, and this is, this is what the scale of things, this is the global electric circuit. So if all mammals are having their own experience and their own umbelt and they're experiencing it just as long as we are there's a whole bunch of stuff happening and that stuff is is the kind of stuff i like to know about here's a big secret everything in the biosphere is constrained by the number four everything in the biosphere and the biosphere is all living things in the earth so um, I'm gonna, I want to pull it into the idea of the global electric circuit because we're going to get into that for the next episode. We're going to show how there's interrelated, interpenetrating circuits through telluric currents that go through the earth all the way through magma from one side to the earth. And these spirits and sprites and lightning and earth and beings are all the exact same thing. They're, 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 we are this soup a brine of living brothy frothy life and together when one person dies there a bubble pops and the energy moves and when a lightning strikes and when huge arcs of lightning strike it's to make up for uh to to try to keep the a bubble floating like a minimal en energy surface so man i can't wait to get into uh the the word is uh, you know how I heard it explained recently, buddy. That what, we we think we're the battery, but really we're the charge. Okay, that's a good way to put it. That's a really that good way sense. to put it. Yeah, uh, 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 that really like connected for me because I often feel like something is coming through me, and I'm drawing from within something. That isn't necessarily me, but I, I'm, you know, it it, 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 it it fits with my my experiential, you know, sort of interaction with myself. That really, I'm the charge, not the battery. But that doesn't mean I'm not the battery. It just means that in this that that the, my my true essence is the charge. I guess I don't know. Oh wow, that's weird. A transluminal events. It went to the heart. <laughs> TLEs. Wow. Oh. Huh. It's supposed to be. Oh, that's weird. It always usually goes to plasma anyway. That's how we got plasma and to begin with any is because blood. Blood is like plasma. And plasma is like is is the ether. So I don't know. Oh, transient luminal events. Transient luminous events. There we go. TLEs. Mm-hmm. There's a little preview in the next week. Mm. Oh, this is what I became this last weekend. Oh, yeah. This is how you move around the Earth. To become an Earth creature, a living global circuit. Fucking dial into that shit and make yourself an open conduit and some dangerous stuff might happen. So be careful. I'm only saying this, like I'm not condoning. I, do it with your mind. You don't need any drugs, you know, even though I do condone uh, entheogens, I'm a proponent of uh, maps and maps are doing a good job at, legalizing that i i think that a lot of people will help get out of their anxiety and their uh introvertedness and some weird things it helps you work through some strange things about your your body 
So this was October 10th. This was right around the largest solar flare that we that happened since uh, the last one that just went off a couple of weeks ago. These are beautiful, and they're they're uh, they have bilateral symmetry, and they seem to when they go off when the sprites particularly go off, they seem to all center a hollow throne and all faces are, 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 they look like people and like angels and they look like they're looking towards this center. And what's in the center? What's in the center? The throne. There's nothing in the center. Behold, it's hollow. I think it's all hollow. Hollow it is. Hollow would be thy name. Hollow it is. Hollow and holy it is. Hollywood. But yeah, it's really cool. So I can't wait till next week, guys. Thank you for joining us this week. Um, we definitely got into some close personal things. It's good for me to open up to the world and for the world to uh, um, consume the information. Eat. Take. Eat. Pass it around. Daily Hollywood bread, be daily life. Hollow would be your hole. Make sure you get those sphincters <laughs> nice and purdy and take care of them. Uh, and work, work on your love muscle, not the, not the genitals, the love muscle of the heart. Cry and fall in love so you can feel what it's like to come back out of love, even if it's with a plant, because you could be loving everything. Love the... Love the, you know, it, I don't know. It's weird because the Bible says, you know, don't love the earth or anything in the earth. And I'm like, bitch. I'm like, man, I love, it's beautiful. I can, I can love it. I appreciate that. Thank you. I don't know about that sentiment. <laughs> I love, I love love. I have an abundance of love. That's, that's it. And to love love. This is all you need. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to open it up. If you guys have any questions or closing remarks, try and make it uh, look close, slower, no, uh, shorter. Very episode. interesting. I was listening all the time. I couldn't be just in front of the computer all the time, but I I, I heard everything. <laughs> I was very attentive. A very nice episode. Really, very interesting. It is a strange episode. I appreciate that. Art opening. So, <laughs> yeah. Pity that there are not more people around right now. Yeah, well, um, it's it's fine. People will have to catch up on the episode, or uh, you know, it's my soul. I wear my soul on my sleeve. Hard on, I have a heart on, and it's right on my sleeve, and that's why I wear it. Proud. Yeah, no, you're doing a very very good job. Thank you guys. You too. Now I'm gonna go cry because I love you so much. <laughs> And we do, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God bless you guys. I love you so much. Okay. Right. See you soon. Thank you for being here for Episode 28, Season 3. Please enjoy Abyssal Dionysus Geometry.
whether we're riding or whether we're grabbing as long as I'm riding with you. It don't matter whether we're riding or whether we're grabbing as long as I'm riding with you. It don't matter whether we're riding or whether we're grabbing as long as I'm riding with you. It don't matter whether we're riding or whether we're grabbing as long as I'm riding with you. Be the person to burden your emergency the first hand urgency's the second hand Supply and demand A find a definitive intervention for man Not a division code but a source code Not a kiss and a toad and a turn into a prince Not a turtle and a herd Not a fair tale Not a narrative Not a nursery rhyme Not an aeroplane on a water plane With this be a life in the tangible truth Parallel to perfect air And if I curtain care And if I hair again Nancy Kerrigan Fair skin hairpins Nails hurt tail spin Sonic speed honestly All I need is the good weed and the beer Is empty and I beat you with a curse word. Word. Verbs are pressure where the wound bleeds in order to swoon me a spoon bee. Kumbaya killed him with the curfew option. Curfew option. Curfew option. option. Adoption of property. The bippity boppity boo. The vapor that comes out of you. The people are robbing you of your spirit because you have none. Me and me, and I will do what you need me to do. Do, I'll do what you need me to do. I'll do what you need me to do. I'll do, I'll do, I'll do. I'll do. I'll do.
gonna be the dawn and then the dark. I never sit all together all alone at the same time. I never kill. I never kill. One voice, one choice, nothing more, nothing less, here we go, flex, 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 your flow, flex, flow, flex, your flow, here we go, flex, flex, your flow, your flow, flex, your flow. Oh